What's up geeks and welcome to the channel. In a previous video of the series, we explained and implemented Dijkstra's algorithm which is used to find the shortest path from a given single node to all other nodes of the graph. In today's video, we will be detailing Floyd Warshall's algorithm which is also used to find the shortest path. However, this one will return the paths between all the pairs of vertices in a given weighted graph. This algorithm works for both directed and undirected weighted graphs, but it doesn't work for graphs with negative cycles, i.e. where the sum of the edges weight of a cycle in that graph is negative. You will later see that the implementation of this algorithm is very straightforward. However, the explanation is a bit tricky, so let's dive right into it. To calculate the shortest paths between the vertices of a graph, Floyd Warshall computes what we call the transitive closure of that graph. The transitive closure extends a graph with additional edges between all indirectly connected pairs of nodes. So, take the small graph you see in front of you as an example. Here vertices A and B are connected by an edge as well as B and C. This means that a transitive closure will extend the graph with an edge from A to C since a path from A to C exists via B. What we just did is the main logic on which the floyd warshall algorithm relies. Now, let's take this one step further and try to deduce the shortest paths between all the vertices of the graph you see in front of you with the help of this technique. To do that, we will first start by writing the weights matrix corresponding to the given graph. Then we have to perform five iterations as we have five nodes, where in each case we consider one of the nodes as a potential intermediate node and check if that node can introduce a transitive edge to the given graph. So let's start with node A. You can see that this node only has edges coming out of it, and for a node to be a potential intermediate node for others, it should have edges coming both in and out of it. Therefore, we can't do anything with A. Let's move on to node B. Concerning node B, B can be an intermediate node if we are traversing the graph from A to D or from E to D, and hence can introduce the transitive edges you see in front of you. Now, these edges have a smaller weight than the ones stored inside the matrix we drew a few seconds ago. You see, before having these edges, there was no direct path linking vertices A and D or E and D. Hence, the weight separating them was represented as infinity. But with the help of node B, we will be able to update our matrix and say that the minimum cost of traveling from A to D is 10 and from E to D is 11 instead of infinity. With that done, we can now move to node C, as no other paths can be deduced from B. Concerning node C, which is our third iteration, we can see that one transitive edge can be added, the edge of weight 6, linking A and E. Let's update our matrix and move on to node D. You see added transitive edges that go in or out a certain node should also be taken into consideration, meaning that in this example we have two routes to take care of, BDE and ADE. Now, the weight of ADE is 16, which is bigger than the value already stored in our table equal to 6. Therefore, there is no need to add this transitive edge. However, BDE has a weight of 13 and should replace the infinity value we have. Okay, let's proceed to the last node, E. We have a lot of paths to take into consideration here, so let's start with the path from D to B via E, which will replace the infinity weight with a value of 10. Then we have path D to C via E costing 11, which will also update our matrix. We also have the path from B to C via E with the help of the transitive edge we found in the previous iteration. This one has a weight of 18, which is still way better than having infinity. And the last two paths via E are both from C, one has B as a destination and the other D. The latter uses a transitive edge as well. The final matrix we generated represents the cost of the shortest paths between any two given vertices in the graph. So, say that you want to find the shortest cost to travel from A to E, you will take in the matrix row A, column E, and deduce that the cost is 6. Let's go ahead now and see how, with the help of this matrix, we can detect negative cycles inside a graph. But first, let's answer what is a negative cycle, and why we initially said that it causes a problem. You see, in a negative cycle, we can start from one node and reach it again via a path with negative total costs. For example, in the following graph, the cyclic path BCDB has a total cost of minus 1. And that is problematic because we can traverse the negative cycle as many times as we like, and with each round, we are going to reduce the total cost on all nodes included in the path. So, suppose that we are looking for the path with the lowest cost from A to E. 
The obvious path would be A, B, C, D, E with a total cost of 12. However, nothing prevents us to go back from node D to B and take the path A, B, C, D, B, C, D, E. The total cost of this path is 11. By going through the negative cycle once, we have reduced the total cost by 1. And if we follow the negative cycle 12 times, the total cost will be 0. And we can keep going as much as we like, 100 or 1000 times to reduce the total cost even more. There are infinite possibilities and infinite paths we can decide to pick, each reducing our shortest path further. Thus, the algorithm would never end, or if we terminate it after a certain number of iterations, it would not return the shortest path. So, how do we detect such paths? You see, a negative cycle from any node will cause the cost from that node to itself to be negative. The floyd warshall algorithm makes it very easy for us to see this. We can read the cost of all nodes to themselves directly from the matrix diagonal. Here is the matrix from the example we just saw. As you can see, the diagonal contains negative values. However, notice how in the previous example we had, the diagonal line contained only zeros, meaning that there are no negative cycles. If there was a negative number in at least one field on the diagonal, a negative cycle would be detected, and ideally the algorithm should terminate with an error message. Now, the matrix we got at the end after applying the floyd warshall algorithm calculates only the cost of the shortest paths between two nodes, but not the paths themselves. So how do we retrieve the paths corresponding to each cost? To do that, the algorithm should be extended with a second matrix, usually called the successor matrix. In this matrix, we initially enter for each node pair the respective end node, meaning the source and destination nodes linked by the initial edges of the graph, as soon as we find a shorter path via an intermediate node, that intermediate node becomes itself the shortest route leading to that destination node. So, as an example, in iteration 2, we found a shorter path from A to D via B, hence B becomes the successor of A on the path to D. In the end, if we update the whole matrix, it should look like this. So, how can we read the shortest paths from this matrix? Take the path from B to C that we had calculated in the fifth iteration. We read from the matrix, the direct successor of B on the route to C is D. The direct successor of D on the route to C is E. The direct successor of E on the route to C is C. The target node is reached. Thus, the complete shortest path is B, D, E, C. Let's go ahead now and try to implement this algorithm together. The first thing we'll need to do is provide our constructor with both the matrices we talked about, the weights matrix and the successors matrix, then with the help of either one, retrieve the number of vertices we are dealing with. We also created an inf variable to represent the infinity weight we previously mentioned. Note that you can deduce the successors matrix from the weights matrix, there is no need to provide it, but in this video I want to focus on the algorithm itself, and I'm trying not to overwhelm you with unnecessary code, so we'll stick with that. Okay, as we mentioned, we will need to perform iterations equal to the number of nodes we have where each node will be viewed as the intermediate node. And while we consider each node an intermediate node, we have to go through all possible combinations of node pairs in the graph. This is done with the help of two additional nested for loops. Now, inside these loops, we have to check if the cost of the path from the start node till the end node via the intermediate node is smaller than the direct path from the start to the end node. This was done here with the help of the getWeight via intermediate node helper method you see in front of you. So if that is the case, then we have found a shorter path from the start to the end node via the intermediate node, and as a consequence, we have to update the weight and the successor node in both our matrices as we previously explained. Here we can optionally add a small condition to check if we can identify in the resulting matrix a negative cycle. And if yes, we can throw an exception and or display a certain message to the user. If not, we can print out the resulting shortest paths matrix and successor matrix to the user. To do the printing, I made use of the printing helper methods you see in front of you. Let's go ahead now and test our logic. To do that, I created a main method and provided our Floyd Warshall instance with both the initial weights and successor matrices. Note that we made use of the exact same example we had throughout the video represented by the graph to the right. When we run our code, you can clearly see that the output matches the one we previously got and is as expected. So, that's it for this video. I hope it was helpful. Thank you guys for watching. Take care, and I will see you in the next one.